Hi, and welcome to another Entrepreneur Stories episode. You've probably seen me from the previous episode, Afonso from Bundle. But this is not about me. This is not about Bundle today. This is about the great entrepreneurs that we've been on the hunt for. These are people who are building businesses within businesses. These are people who are actually adding inspiration and fuel to the fire to all of those of you out there who are thinking of starting your own business within your business. I love this story, and I'm actually here with a good friend of mine, Yulia Savitskaya. Yulia is going to talk to us about a management program for leadership and leadership training she did when she was working at A Great Place to Work in the U.S. Now, A Great Place to Work is a consultancy firm, really helping companies improve through data what they do. But within that, Yulia started a whole new framework of leadership training, and that became a $2 million per year revenue stream and a new business for them. But that's not my story, and I don't know all the challenges, so it's over to Yulia, and she's going to tell us a lot more about it. Good morning, Yulia, from San Francisco, so it's early, early hours there, right? Uh, it's, it's 9 o'clock, but for Silicon Valley, it's quite early. <laughs> it, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us, and I'm really excited to learn more about um, your story, but we know each other for a little while. We studied together, but the reality is I had no idea about your entrepreneurship trek, and I'm trying to find out more, and you told me you actually did this in a franchise business, but I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's kind of go back to how was this born? How did you have this inception of we're going to do something different, we're going to prove that it's revenue driving, we're going to incorporate it as is it a product offering, what is it, and tell us more about it. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the great place to work is a mission driven consultancy and, and what makes it different is it operates on a franchise model, meaning that people are real entrepreneurs owe the license to operate, you know, their IP and methodology, but they're really very entrepreneurial in spirit and they're in 40 countries all over the world. So the challenge in terms of business context is one, it's a franchise business Two, it's in 40 countries around the world. So localization is another really huge challenge. Um, when the project came about, Great Place to Work um, had mostly been focusing on creating best workplaces lists around the world. So in the U.S., they're known for Fortune 100 best list um, and consultancy services. But the need came that more and more clients were coming to us and saying, you know what, we really need some kind of more hand-holding management education program to really bring your concepts and advice to life in a day-to-day -day setting. How does a manager really bring the best in their employees? And so um, at that point in time, I was a great place to work for probably four years. I was the evaluator of companies. And the founder, Robert Loving, approached me and said, would you like to take this on? I know you have interest in psychology. We've worked together in the past. Um, you don't have a budget that's set. Uh, the timeline is as soon as you can, and you don't really have a team, but all of these things are, are, are for grabs. The vision is uh, it's going to be a leadership development program that has no PowerPoint, that's interactive and life transforming, and you know you need to sell, <laughs> you need to deliver the revenue. So that was uh, that. That's how that was started. So you had, if I get it right, right, you had a vessel, right? This vessel is going to be a program. Mm -hmm. You have no money in this vessel. You have no team in this vessel. You have no content to date in this vessel. Correct. But it will be a product and it will be sold and you have to do it as quick as possible. What did you yeah. do next? How did you plan this out? Yeah, it was, it was actually very exciting because I think what, what makes entrepreneurship so exciting is you have all the resources of the organization, but all the freedom of the entrepreneur, right? And so um, the first thing, uh, we assembled a team. So uh, my core team was three people um, and then contractors. So we hired instructional designers and, and support um, that way. Then uh, we started identifying what's the content like. And I think what, what really worked best that I would really advise is involving your stakeholders really, really early. We did a week-long retreat up in the mountains where we locked ourselves for an entire week with a number of people from other countries to really brainstorm the content, like what, what could change people's lives. It was 
very intense. Uh, but I think it was good because one, it created buy-in from them early on. And two, we brought a lot of diversity of opinions. So the first step was creating content. And um, that took about, I would say it took about two to three months. Uh, the next step was figuring out what vessel and exercises would be part of that two-day program. And honestly, the challenge was we faced a lot of resistance. People wanted PowerPoint, especially internal stakeholders said, no training can exist without PowerPoint. How are you going to keep anyone's attention for two days? And um, the founder was very clear. He's like, no PowerPoint, just not an option. And so that was very challenging to start going around and saying it is possible and here's what we're doing. And then so the creating the exercises and the framework took maybe another three, four months. Um, then there was a design phase where we curated workbooks and posters and materials. And then um, I did a roadshow around the world, traveling to one country internationally every month, and either certifying trainers how to deliver the training or helping local affiliates, that's how we call the franchisee offices, think about go-to-market and how it fits within their offering. So all in all, it was about a two-year project. Um, from from inception um, to to finish. Okay, so I just want to kind of so I'm going to go back to the ideation phase when you went up to the cabin and you 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 touched on the importance of having stakeholders involved early. So in this cabin, you ideated and with people around the world. And did you have your the buy-in from the founder? Was the founder there? Yeah, he was there. He was, uh, he's the subject matter expert, um, Robert Levering. So he very much, um, you know, led the, both the visioning and the content creation. What we didn't have the expertise in was a lot of the training and leadership development knowledge. And so we selected the people to fly in who specifically had that background to complement um, the skills that we didn't have. And the, the team that you assembled, these additional three people who teamed up with you on, on this project, were they doing this in addition to their day job or did they kind of drop it i got a role in entrepreneurship in the company and join you how, how did that work for them that's a great question that's actually always the challenge right because you do have your day job on top of this um we were based in headquarters who had um responsibility for every all other franchise services including you know meetings and annual reviews and things like that um, I was lucky enough that things were cleared off of my plate. So about 80% of my time was dedicated to this project and 20% other things. For other team members, it varied between, I would say, 50 and 60% and, and of their time. That's uh, challenging to say the least. And what about budgets? At what point did you say, well, this is all good and great, but without some money? And how did, how did you do it? Did you go to the founder and say, well, it is your idea. Um, how did you manage that part of the budget? Funny enough, um, the program ended up being, I mean, sort of, so their ROI ended up being really good um, because most of the budget came from, well, our salaries and contractors that we really hired. And then at some point in time, I still did not have a number. Every every line item I had to go and justify and say, this is what I need. This is why I needed. This is the price. At one point in time, I think we decided to use design services in Chile because um, that was cheaper and we have offices in 40 countries. So they actually had relationships. So maybe halfway through, I realized, oh, wait, this is entrepreneurship. So we should be using resources all over the world at which are cheaper in other places uh, other than San Francisco. So at that point, I think we started using more people in India, more people in Chile, and but the budget was always very flexible, to be honest. And as which is good in your case, I guess. And yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming um, this ambassador and buy-in from your founder, he was always there, right? You didn't have a change in leadership and have to go through that. Oh. That's good, and. When do you think corporate, it sounds like it was all advantages, was corporate ever a disadvantage in the sense that there was a hurdle or a point where you hit some roadblocks and how you can proceed with a program? Yeah, so I think what, what made it really challenging is, um, and, and this is probably lessons learned for me, what I would do differently going forward is... Um, as a franchise business, you want consistency across operations and you want the brand to look and feel the same. 
However, each single country has their own unique context and situation and sometimes additional product offerings. So I think where I would do things differently is I think corporate has been a little too rigid about this is the program, this is how it's run, you have to be certified to deliver it, this is the price point in your market based on what we know. And and what it ended up being is probably a year into it, we learned that, you know what, people in, let's say, Latin America are fine with a two-day training um, most of them maybe live in the capital, and so it's easier for them to stay overnight and then come back. But then people in Europe have to fly out from all over Europe, and so they're they want a one day training. That's not going to work, right? And then India realized that you know what, we can offer really amazing coaching services on top of this, and we want to make this like six month long transformational program. Um, and I think as corporate, at first we were like, let's just stick to the book. This is what we created. But then we learned that it's actually, it, it would have been probably better and what I would do differently is uh, set more flexible parameters. So this is the core offering. Here's the menu of options you can do before, after, during, and here. That's how you go. So that's one thing I would do differently. I think at another, um, another thing I would do differently is more go-to-market thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, where we really, really nailed is an inspiring, great product that, that I've led a number of sessions myself and people still come to me and say change their lives and change how they think about themselves as a manager and, and how they relate to their employees as human beings. Sounds revolutionary. <laughs> um, but the product was great, um, but what we could have done better is probably more support around go-to-market, more sort of like when in the point of sale cycle do you introduce this program? Here's a bunch of materials for brochures and flyers to support you in this. Here's more case studies, you know, here's success stories and things like that. And I think we we trusted that our local offices would do a lot of that work, and they did, but I think we could have done more to support the particular go-to-market and sales strategy. And before we go into go-to-market buy-in, when you develop, let's say, your first products and your first programs, how did you validate what was working, what was not working? Did you do some beta testing? Did you have some pilot teams? How did that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. So the first phase was um, we picked, I think, three or four clients and um, delivered it for free to them and recorded the entire session. Um, and then had very long debrief sessions, like exercise session, section by section, exercise by exercise, what worked, what didn't work, what was confusing. And then I painfully have to watch a video recording of myself for two days and pick apart everything I did right and wrong with a team of five people. It was very painful watching myself on video. Um, after we've gone a round of validation through um, clients first, then I did a roadshow and did a round of validation with our affiliates. Um, so, um, you know, we, sh- we shared with them what, what was working. The funny lesson there was design makes a difference. So the first version that we shared with them was just a Word document with the content and we ran through the content and here's what it is. And people said, oh, you know, it's like, mm, it's okay. It's on the right path, but not there. And literally a month later, I had a designer make it pretty, workbooks, you know, things like that. And we went back and said, hey, this is what we've done. And the response was completely different. People are like, oh, wow, it looks amazing. It looks great. No content has changed in the months between now and then. So so the lesson there that I, that I want to, you know, share is there's a very tricky balance between sharing internally, especially things very early because you want to bring people into the process and give you feedback versus being late enough to actually show what the vision is and, and how it's supposed to look as a finish to help people see the finished product. And I think in the latter case, I think we shared maybe a little too early and people couldn't really see the finished product. So when, when they came together, it was a lot better. Mm, I think, I think, well, I love the fact that you love design. I love design. So that's, that's great to hear, but I totally understand. Like sometimes, you know, you need to fake it till you make it, but there's a limit to how much you can fake until you get to the final product that people can actually touch and feel right. So if I understand correctly, you had this amazing project, you had great managerial founder buy-in, you had a timeline, um, of as soon as possible. And I believe you put the milestones together for what was going to be delivered. You did a, um, ideation, you did validation, and then you redeveloped the product and put it out there in the markets. Now you're a franchised business. 
right? And I just want to kind of learn myself. And if there are any entrepreneurs out there who are working in it in franchise businesses, I want to know how does that work? Are you the franchisor or are you a franchisee? And how do you go about replicating this product? What? How do you do that? Yeah, um, franchisee is, is a very interesting business. The advantage is you scale really quickly because you don't own assets around the world. We don't own offices, right? So that's that's the advantage. The disadvantage is you have standardization challenges a lot of the times um, and the level of customization for all localization needs to be really different. So I was part of headquarters, which is a franchisor that issues the license on an annual basis. And the tricky part of the relationship is while I am and my team is responsible for providing services for, for franchisees, I'm also responsible for watching out for standards possibly being violated. And our team has the right to revoke the license, which we've never done. But that's the that's kind of the, the carrot and the stick relationship there is, you know, I want to support you. But at the end of the day, you know, we could revoke the license if there was a very grave violation. And with that, um, the franchisee business becomes a web of relationships that you really need to navigate, um, serving their needs and serving the needs of the franchisor, which is brand integrity, mission-driven services, and, you know, financial well-being. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the setup. And in terms of fluctuation of what is used so the brand is the same around the world but then different affiliates have different product lines and different suite um, of products that they they can offer and there's also fairly strict methodology for employee surveys that we do how we assess great workplaces and um, on the consulting services it's a bit more variation because it's ad hoc this is great and i just want to wrap up this project because it's so cool that you did this in such a setup it's complex it's unique to an extent but it seems like starting with that buy-in was really helpful to get it off the ground and having subject matter experts like you did you at any point think you know what i can actually become an entrepreneur and develop a lot of these programs myself or do you just think that entrepreneurship gave you the assets and the leverage that you needed what 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 is your thinking there hmm um, I really think that if you have any inkling of entrepreneurship spirit, which is um, resourcefulness, ability to really listen to people and really understand where they're coming from and bring them on to your journey and a lot of energy, like a lot of feedback that I was told was, you know, your sheer like brute force energy rolled this project really forward because you believed in it. And so people believe in you and then they believe in your project. And that's that's the equation there. Um I think that a lot of people can can become entrepreneur. It's it's safer. I mean, if you're in the organization, right? You still have your salary. You you have your resources. You have people supporting you along the way, and you have this vast knowledge and framework and content that you could leverage. So it is it's it's abundant that way. If you just compare it to entrepreneurship, which can be a little bit more scrappy. The flip side of it is you have a lot more stakeholders to manage and a lot more. Um, pressure a lot of times to deliver and respond to the requests of others. But I think what makes a great entrepreneur is resourcefulness, um, ability to get things done scrappily, right? Um, Relationship building is another one. Um, In relationship building and really listening to what people are telling to you and bringing them on board to your vision. And then the last one, I think systems thinking. Um, Because organizations are complex, people's needs are complex. Um, I think entrepreneurs need to understand how complex organizations work and how to navigate with that that system um, really successfully. That, that's well, you've answered so many questions that I had already, but I, I take a good quote out of that and that I'll, I'll, I'll actually use it later. But I just want to ask you one more thing, actually two. Uh, the first one is our previous interviewer, interviewee, sorry, um, he wanted me to ask you, if you could go back to that project, what's the one thing you would redo? Um, I think I already mentioned that the go-to-market part. I really think I did not spend um, enough time 
supporting individual unique countries on the go-to-market and sales side. And that was what I think uh, when I left Great Place to Work, quite honestly, stalled the adoption for a couple months until things were picked up again. Um, because I relied on just me being there to support everybody. And when I left, that system was gone. So it took a little bit of a while to adjust and fill in that gap. But that's one thing I would do differently. That's great. And what question can you leave me today that I can take to the next interview I do? I love that. I love that part of, uh, of your ritual. It's kind of an yeah. easy exit for me. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> I think it's passing the baton. Um, the question would be, as an entrepreneur, you make a lot of small decisions mm -hmm. every day, and that's exciting. However, looking back at the project, can you think of one decision that in retrospect was actually a really big one? And would you do it again the same way? Mm-hmm. Okay. Like a pivot point that you didn't know was a pivot point up until some point in the future. Pivoting is great. Are you going to do more entrepreneurship projects in the future? Absolutely. Well, I would love to. I would love to. I'm currently in a small startup, you know, Solvi. We do machine learning and supporting customer, um, customer experience through uh, automation. And so we're 50 people company. So I'm essentially entrepreneuring inside. Uh, but I would love to be intrapreneur as well. This is great. This is, I got so much. And I want to thank you, Yulia, for being with us um, early hours of San Francisco. And I'm, I hope I can interview you on your next venture then. Thank you. This has been so much fun. And I can't wait to hear more of uh, interviews. I'm, from I will. Here. I'll let you know. If you can hold on just for one second, I'm just going to turn to camera real quick and say, well, Yulia has really shared how having buy-in and how having the lay of the land of experts and is, you're able to have a mission and a mandate to build uh, entrepreneurship story and a venture within that becomes a product. Now, one great thing that she said is people first believe in you, then they believe in your project. This is a message to entrepreneurs there. Um, thank you everyone for being with us today. And if you've watched this on YouTube, you are on bundle tube. If not, you don't want to watch us. You don't want to see us. Look at the screen. We have this in all podcast forms. So please download it. It's on all platforms. If you want to hear it. Second ask for me is if you're an entrepreneur out there, please get in touch. Let me know who you are. Let me know your story. We can interview you. I'd love to learn more. There's so many insights every time we do this. And last, please feel free to leave comments and questions below. My email will be there. Please get in touch. I can get those questions back to Yulia and we can start a conversation. So thank you. This was Entrepreneur Stories. I'll see you in two more weeks. Thank you. Bye.